Hepatoblastoma is the third most common intra-abdominal neoplasm. The incidence is highest during infancy. Around two-thirds of hepatic malignancies present in, uh, it accounts for around two-thirds of the tumors in kids younger than 20 and 90% of those younger than five. The other disease is hepatocellular carcinoma. It's a liver malignancy of adolescents. It accounts for around 95% of the liver malignancies in kids that are 15 and older. It is most frequent than, uh, more frequent than hepatoblastoma in Asia and Africa, where the hepatitis B infection is endemic. So differential diagnosis of these tumors needs to consider the age in which they occur. In infancy, there are benign conditions that could mimic hepatoblastoma, like hemangioendothelioma, mesenchymal hamartoma, and teratoma. Hepatoblastoma presenting the first year of life oftentimes is the small cell undifferentiated histology, but you can also have rhabdoid tumors as described. Less frequently, yolk sac tumors, LCH, M7, etc. Between one and three years of age, think of hemangioendothelioma and mesenchymal hamartomas, but for a malignant tumor, always hepatoblastoma, followed by biliary tract rhabdomyosarcoma, and less frequently, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. After three years of age, hepatoblastoma incidence drops, and you start thinking about hepatocellular carcinoma. There are few benign tumors between three and 10. The most common could be the picomas. The malignant tumors that you need to consider hepatocellular carcinoma, but then always make the differential diagnosis with embryonal sarcoma of the liver, and less frequently angiosarcomas and others. And in adolescents, think about adenomas, focular nodal hyperplasia, and biliary, biliary tumors. And the malignant tumors are almost always hepatocellular carcinomas. The fibrolemular vari variant is the one you need to consider. Liver tumors are associated with uh, several risk factors, whether congenital or environmental. Hepatoblastoma is associated with familial polyposis, Gardner syndrome, back with Wiedemann syndrome, hemihypertrophy, and glycogen storage diseases. Hepatocellular carcinoma with hereditary tyrosinemia, biliary cirrhosis, uh, glycogen storage disease, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and hemochromatosis. But there are as well environmental factors for hepatoblastoma, Fetal alcohol syndrome is associated with an increased incidence, but most notably prematurity and low birth weight that we'll discuss in the next slide. For hepatocellular carcinoma, as you know, hepat hepatitis B and C always need to be considered. So let's talk about some of these risk factors that could be uh, on the board. So prematurity and low birth weight is associated with an increased incidence of hepatoblastoma, and there is a disproportionate number of cases in low birth weight kids. So the relative risk increases with uh, the lower uh, the weight. Back with Wiedemann syndrome is well known to be associated with hepatoblastoma. As you know, this is a syndrome uh, with a, it's a complex multigenic disorder with uh, growth regulatory genes on 11P15. It's very rare with an incidence of one in 10,000 live births, presents with overgrowth, abdominal wall defects, macroglosia, GU malformations, organomegaly, hyperinsulinemia, and others. And the malignancy risk is around 8 to 10% during the first decade of life. The most common is Wilms tumor, followed by hepatoblastoma and adrenocortical tumors. Hemihypertrophy is also very rare, presenting in one in uh, more than uh, 50,000 uh, live births, to be conservative. It's isolated or is associated with back with Wiedemann syndrome or others like Clippel Trenone Weber or McCune Albright syndromes. And the malignancy risk is similar to the back with Wiedemann, around 5%, and with the same, the same type of tumors, Wilms, hepatoblastoma, adrenocortical. The most, probably the better known association is with uh, familial adenomatous polyposis and Gardner syndrome. And these are syndromes defined by germline APC mutations. In FAP, these are usually gastric tumor desmoids, but always remember these patients may present or always have congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, so that's a good way to screen these babies at birth. The Gardner syndrome also has osteomas. 
It's estimated around 5 to 10 percent of hepatoblastomas have FAP syndrome. That's important for family history. So we usually recommend APC testing in sporadic hepatoblastoma. The lifetime risk of hepatoblastoma for children uh, of FAP families is around 1 in 250 compared to 1 in 100,000 in the general population. That means that the relative risk of developing hepatoblastoma is around 800. Hepatoblastoma presents usually as an asymptomatic abdominal mass, can be with weight loss, anorexia, emesis, and abdominal pain. The AFP is elevated in greater than 90% of the cases. Around 20% of the cases have metastatic disease that is usually intraperitoneal, in the lymph nodes, in the brain, or in the tumor uh, or local tumor uh, thrombus, but uh, obviously the most common is in the lungs. Many of these kids present with thrombocytosis. It's rare, though, that these patients may present with hypertension or precocious, precocious puberty because of secretion of renin or uh, uh, beta-HCG. Differential diagnosis has to be with biliary rhabdomyosarcoma that usually presents with jaundice, with hemangiendothelioma, and these patients might present with congestive heart failure or with a Casabac merit phenomenon if it's a caposiform hemangiendothelioma. And hemangiomas and hemangiendotheliomas, remember, that can present with hypothyroidism because of the presence of iodothyrosine diiodinase. <laughs> So the pathology of hepatoblastoma is uh, rather complex and has to always be reviewed by a pathology expert. So hepatoblastoma rises from a precursor to the mature hepatocyte. You may see 5% of uh, in the undifferentiated small cells. These small cells usually grow to become these embryonal epithelial cells that mimic the liver at six or eight weeks of gestation. But then you have then another component that is a well-differentiated uh, fetal hepatocyte that we'll describe later. And that's basically how you describe the pathology. The majority of the cases, 85 to 90 percent, present with um, the epithelial form that is either fetal or embryonal uh, hepatoblastoma, 7 to 10 percent with pure fetal histology. These have an excellent outcome, and the stage one can be cured with surgery only. And then around 5% present with what is called a small cell undifferentiated histology that you need to remember. These have very poor prognosis, usually associated with a low AFP, and is associated with 22Q11 aberrations. That's basically mutations in the SNF5 gene, meaning that when you do immunostochemistry, there is a loss of INI1. The biology of uh, uh, hepatoblastoma is basically defined by activation of the wind pathway. You will find activating mutations in beta-catenin or APC in greater than 90% of the cases, and you may also find a regulation of wind signaling genes. Around 5% of these cases have NERF2 mutations, and this is associated with a worse prognosis. And you may find other alterations, like mutations in epigenetic modifiers or in others. The workup of a hepatoblastoma always starts with good exam and then diagnostic imaging and ultrasound with Doppler helps evaluate cystic versus solid masses, the patency and involvement of the vascular system that is important for surgery, and usually CT scan of chest, abdomen, and pelvis or an MRI that define the disease extent, the vascular supply, and the operability. Laboratory workup always needs to include alpha fetoprotein is the most valuable test. It's elevated in around 90% of the cases, but remember, and we'll get back to that later, the biologic half-life is around five to seven days, and that's important when you monitor response. Pathology is critical. Usually you do a biopsy or a front resection, but remember, if you do a true good biopsy, do multiple passes because the pathology can be patchy and you want to identify the different components. So the AFP is elevated in most of the liver tumors that you will see. Greater than 90% of hepatoblastomas, around 60 to 7% of hepatocellular carcinomas, but could be normal in the fibrolamellar variant of HCC. In hepatoblastoma, a low AFP, less than 100, is associated with worse prognosis and with SCU, small cell and differentiated histology. AFP can also be elevated in uh, benign tumors like infantile hemangiendothelioma and mesenchymal hamartoma. 
We stage retinal uh, hepatoblastoma either with surgical or imaging, and we'll go over that briefly. The surgical resection has been the mainstay of therapy and is required for cure. So the staging based of surgical criteria that we use mostly in North America and Germany is the standard uh, stage one, two, three, four, based on complete resection, microscopic, macroscopic, or metastatic disease. But we're using more and more the radiographic criteria that has been implemented by Siopel in Europe, which is preoperative staging, and is a staging based on radiographic criteria that we call pre-text, meaning pre-treatment extent of disease. And by this, we define the liver in four different sectors based on resectability, blood supply. Pretext one is one sector, pretext two, two sectors, pretext three, two non-adjoining sectors, or three sectors involved. Pretext four, all four sectors are involved, and it correlates with prognosis. As we said, surgery is the mainstay of curative therapy. Only 30% of patients have resectable disease at presentation. Remember that surgery only can be curative in 90% of patients with pure fetal hepatoblastoma. Radiation therapy doesn't really have a role in hepatoblastoma, only as palliative therapy. So chemotherapy has two roles. One, adjuvant after surgery, you always have to use chemotherapy. And neoadjuvant, when you have decided that you will start with chemotherapy before surgery. So resection is possible in up to one-third of the cases. And so if you do upfront surgery, there is a value of it identifying the patients that might not require chemotherapy or minimal therapy. If you do neoadjuvant chemotherapy, there is a value because you can increase the number of patients achieving a complete resection. You can reduce surgical morbidity and you have more time for surgical planning. But both options are valid uh, based on what is the expertise of the team. Chemotherapy, as we will review, is basically cisplatin based. In North America, we use cisplatin, 5-FU, and viscristin, which is the C5V regimen, and we add doxorubicin, C5VD, for unresectable cases. Siopel in Europe has used the Plato regimen, which is cisplatin with doxorubicin, or cisplatin alone for early stage tumors. And this is basically how we usually manage hepatoblastoma. Low risk is a stage one and stage two non-small cell and differentiated tumors. So it's a, a front surgery plus chemotherapy for those that are uh, non-pure uh, uh, fetal histology. Remember that PFH can be treated with surgery only. We have the category of intermediate risk that is basically stage ones and two small cell and differentiated that are treated with upfront surgery, adjuvant chemotherapy, Stage threes are the unresectable tumors. Usually you start with cisplatin-based therapy, either cisplatin alone, cisplatin with doxorubicin, do surgery, and then you continue for around six cycles. The outcome for intermediate risk hepatoblastoma is, a, is quite good, 70 to 90% survival. And high-risk patients are those with metastatic disease. You start with chemotherapy, you do resection of the primary and the metastasis, and you continue with chemo. So some patients might need liver transplant, and that's approximately 10% of the patients. You need to do early referral to a liver transplant program. It's always recommended for unifocal or multifocal pretext for unifocal or centrally located tumors involving the main hyalur structure or main hepatic veins. There are several factors that contribute to improved survival, complete resection as soon as possible, obviously, and good response to chemotherapy. And lung metastases are not a contraindication of, uh, for transplant if they are resectable. Then we'll close with hepatocellular carcinoma. This is a tumor of the second decade of life. The median age is around 12 years. The fibrolamellar variant accounts for around 20 to 25 percent of the cases. These are patients that present with more protracted clinical presentation over months, usually with a lower AFP. These are very aggressive tumors with metastasis in up to one-third or more of the patients with extra hepatic extension, often multifocal, and in 35% of the cases are associated with liver cirrhosis. So the response to chemotherapy is very low, less than 50%, probably even less than that. Complete resection can happen in around 20 to 30% of the cases, and the patients are upfront candidates for transplant in the absence of extrahepatic disease. 
the outcome is very poor, less than 20 to 30 percent of these patients can be cured. We use chemoembolization in some of these cases. Remember that the normal liver parenchyma has dual blood supply, 75 percent through the portal vein, 25 percent through the hepatic artery. The liver tumors receive their blood supply almost exclusively from the hepatic artery, and that's what you use for chemoembolization. 10 percent of the normal parenchyma is maybe sufficient to maintain metabolic activity. And usually, we don't uh, apply uh, chemoembolization for hepatoblastomas, but it can be done for hepatocellular carcinomas to improve resectability. So there are many uh, long-term effects associated with hepatoblastoma, both related to chemotherapy, such as hearing loss, therapy related to AML, cardiotoxicity or renal toxicity, related to surgery. And then for those patients with the syndrome, particularly the patients with familial uh, polyposis, remember that you need to start then following them for the second malignancy, which is the colon cancer. And over the last 10 minutes, we'll talk about germ cell tumors, also a rare cancer, 